I think it is the vision, the realized feature environment of Blade Runner, which has been the predominant factor in its enduring appeal over the decades. Blade Runner feels so vivid, alive, and exciting, it's as potentially unpleasant and depressing as it also can come across, there always seems a certain vigour in the prospective mundanity of this proposed 2019 Los Angeles. Vangelis' score is the second factor, that feeling of existing amongst a sea of consciousness, all verifying the other, giving more reason and function to the others, a wave of continuous interactions. The feelings of Deckard, or Rachel, or even Leon, or Pris, manifest externally as this music. Blade Runner becomes an object of intellectual fancy, a prescribed text in schools, a fate worse than were mostly forgotten. Blade Runner is now reduced to a fetishized signifier of one's own intellectual, philosophic powers, or a vapid indicator of some more refined tastes. Though it need not be these things, it could, perhaps, ought to be seen as the finest accomplishment in cinematic VFX of the post-Star Wars pre-CGI 77-91 era. Tron is an exception, given its emphasis on computer-generated effects. Accepted, anyway. On top of this, the one time where Philip K. Dick's haunting existential anguish, the futurist nightmares from the frontiers of experience, was seemingly adapted truly successfully on the screen, although some champion Spielberg's Minority Report, it is a rather strong film, it is no Blade Runner, to the extent wherein some have called it superior to its original novelized source to Android's dream of electric sheep. I have not read this text, although I suspect that, because the experiential dreamlike quality of hard-boiled detective fiction was more effectively conveyed via cinematic noir rather than through the literature it adapted, this text's quality might have uniquely suited the silver screen, especially in any case. Oh, as far as uh, cinematic Philip K. Dick goes, there was the very strong Linklater, unusual for Linklater, strong film, A Scanner Darkly. The film makes me feel like a cell in the universe, like a speck in Leon's eyes he looks over Los Angeles 2019. Ridley Scott proved first of his homage to Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, then of Alien, also a Kubrick homage in a way, though also a grittier, grungier Star Wars lived in and intuitively absorbing. But he was a spectacular builder of worlds. Initially, on The Duelists, a collaborator with photographer Frank Tidy, and then Derek Van Lind for the legendary efforts on 1979's Alien, although Jordan Cronenworth, the finest collaborator of Ridley Scott's directorial career, though also worth mentioning is Alex Thompson's work on 1985's Legend. Yeah, Cronenworth's work on here is a standard which is mesmerising. Cronenworth's other most impressive credits, I would say, are 1980's Altered States from Ken Russell, and for FOTD classic Buckaroo Banzai from 1984 and directed by W.D. Richter. I am rarely more impressed with a film's cinematographic vision, especially up to its point of release, 1982, when we refer to Blade Runner, we really do refer to a film which was released in 1992, a director's cut, but whatever. Oh, and Final Cut was just for money. I still watch for a director's cut. Oh, the one thing the Final Cut did was finally remove that continuity error of in Bryant's dialogue. It ought to be two got fried running through an electrical field rather than one. Amazing how we forgive films for continuity errors where it is convenient and chastise others when we decide we'd like to. The finest audio track in film history. If you were to just listen to Blade Runner and have not seen the film, you might imagine something quite similar to what you would be seeing. Let's discuss the Esper Photo Analysis Machine. According to the film's 1982 press kit, a high-density computer with a very powerful three-dimensional resolution capacity and a cryogenic cooling system. The police cars in Deckard's apartment contain small models which can be channeled into the large one at police headquarters. This big apparatus is a well-worn, retrofitted part of the furniture. Among many functions, the Esper can analyse and enlarge photos, enabling investigators to search a room without being there. Bryant briefs Deckard with the help of an Esper, and Deckard examines Leon's photos with one as well. I've included a link in the description, which will include a very useful Vimeo link that beautifully, articulately, brilliantly, outlines what the Esper machine is doing with the photograph on Deckard's instructions. To me, possibly the most interesting character in the film is Rachel. She has her entire life revealed as a lie, and she doesn't go, oh yeah, those memories are implants, now that you mention it. She cannot fathom that everything was inserted, but then she seems to gradually accept it. 
She still feels the residue of believing one is human, and it prevents her from appreciating being as a replicant, as the renegades do. She is the one replicant, or the one being in this film, who does not feel human at some stage. She believed she was born of woman's womb, and then she doesn't. She knew the difference, although then she does have implanted memories, not knowing from the start she is a replicant creates an impasse which she cannot reconcile. The two major scenes were Rachel is in Deckard's apartment. They feature two of the finest pieces on the Vangelis soundtrack. First, Memories of Green. Look, it's me with my mother. And then, the love theme. Say, kiss me. Kiss me. Oh, a contentious scene that. What do we say to a scene like that now? First of all, no. Probably not wise to do scenes like this anymore. Probably for the better. So that being said, Let's look at this scene in context. Without being obnoxious moralizing ignoramuses, let's try and understand the artistic intent behind this moment. Deckard so badly wants to feel something. He doesn't see Rachel as a human, but he sees her as an honest existential pathos which resonates with him where no one else does. They have found each other lost at sea, human and replicant. Or replicant and replicant. I won't go there, I don't feel like it now. I feel as though the film's screenwriters, Hampton Fancher and David Peoples, wouldn't have written Rachel or this scene the way a woman had would have. If I wrote this scene, I cannot imagine a single woman I've known reading it and thinking, yeah, that's fine, as opposed to, yeah, maybe not do the whole she says something she really means I want to have sex thing. It's an outdated way of men writing women, although if Blade Runner is occupying any world or embodying any identifiable pre-established archetype, it is the hormonally tense film noir spectrum. The film implies that Rachel does want to be with Deckard, she is scared of being attached and then dying before they have a chance to appreciate one another. Uncomfortable way of Deckard to communicate, don't be afraid, do what you want, but it is what we have. Maybe Deckard, clearly a loner and to some degree socially aloof, has never been remotely intimate with anyone before, and so this scene is not meant to be romantic or sweet, but two creatures who are not attuned to intimacy attempting to force a connection with one another. Still. It comes across like poor Rachel is being coerced, and one expect, expects, anticipates, condemnatory articles and attempted takedowns of Blade Runner, Ridley Scott, Harrison Ford, whatever, whoever, the Red Guards are coming out. Okay, settle down. To what degree is the film even endorsing this behaviour, even if it is ugly? Are we to condemn any filmmaker or artist for depicting a sexual assault or something akin to it in their films? Peckinpah, Lynch, Leone, Tarantino? But obviously they were not trying to they were not glorifying the vile actions when committed in this in the fictional context. Is Ridley Scott? To some they might argue it is, not understanding that the use of the score and the film noir aesthetic might actually be sickly ironic. But really, is Ridley Scott trying to glorify such an evil act? Quite obviously not. Remember, Rachel ultimately says, put your hands on me, for whatever that is worth. But is she coerced? Maybe. Sean Young gives her opinion on this scene in an interview I have linked in the description. The interview is from 1982, so maybe she changed her opinion at some stage, although Young's view is that Rachel didn't know how to react to the initiation of intimacy by Deckard, she has nothing to base the behaviour off of, she has never experienced anything remotely like it before, there would be implanted memories at best. Deckard has her confront these strange new feelings, as Young seems to describe. She admits that the scene is an uncomfortable one, not meant to be romantic or tender. Likely as not, she was told this by Ridley Scott when they were filming the scene, so we can take this as a fair assessment, potentially, of the filmmaker's intent in general. Now let's discuss Zora. Zora really just wanted to blend in and live a regular life. She is the least detailed of the four renegade replicants, and one of the more tragic, potentially. She was willing to be an exotic dancer in questionable conditions, circumstances many may describe as exploitative, just to blend in as a human being and not be labelled and forced to live and function as a replicant as an assigned tool. Zora's disguise is perfect, too. Her mannerisms are exactly that of a sarcastic, jaded cynic, unsure of others' intentions. One imagines Zora's character, if she wasn't a replicant, behaving exactly as she was to Deckard. Initially, it being her inevitable disposition, perhaps. Zora's actual worldview, her life story, too, inevitably, leads her to be to that disposition, making a profession wherein she must bear her body a perfect pathological disguise. She assumes the role effortlessly of a human woman whose income is made via the lecherous male gaze, for a replicant woman would inherently know this feeling, 
their world would not be dissimilar, or perhaps this would be the inevitable state of a replicant's mind in general. Flat, affected, or blunted emotionally, expressively apathetic, easy to imagine a woman acting this way due to the behaviour of men, but how about a replicant acting this way due to the behaviour of humans? We, shown, we learn so little about Zora comparatively to the other replicants. She is reduced to a set piece in an action noir, the one time in the film wherein Blade Runner resembles the expected trite of the cop who hunts robots pitch, which this film might have popularly been known as in 1982. Except when Zora dies, it is presented, via slow motion and by Evangelus, as a gross tragedy, the loss of moments in time. One could play Batty's dying words over the scene of Zora being shot dead. That moment in the film made an impression on me when I viewed it, not for the first time, but one of the earlier times, at age 13. They were trying to paint Zora's death as a tragedy, it seemed to me, and it seemed sudden, with a tonal shift, although I then realised that it was I who had gotten lost in the thrill of the cop's hunt, lost in an escapist fantasia, only to be reoriented back into the existential, overwhelmingly emotional, and unforgiving realities of the waking world, so cruel it could be an incoherent dream. Zora's death is an unsung tragedy, as horrifying as Pris or Roy's, it is only disguised by our mind's interpretation of the film's familiar neo-noir veneer as an exciting set piece of a Blade Runner retiring a renegade replicant. Actually, it is a detached police detective murdering a woman who saw being an exotic dancer as a preferable respite to functioning as an off-world replicant, and in a murder squad no less, according to Bryant's briefing to Deckard. And now let's discuss Leon. Leon's interrogation is one of the most fascinating examples of AI in the history of fiction. When I first ever saw that scene, I would have been 11 on a rented DVD, I was hoping that this man was not a replicant for his sake. I became worried for him when he seemed to react to the questions in a manner which was, well, unorthodox, strange, unfamiliar. He didn't know what a tortoise was. But then again, would that be normal in that future environment? Most animals are artificial, it is almost implied. I've never seen a tortoise before, but I understand what you mean. Is that Leon being too literal, or trying to speak like he thinks a human would? Leon's agitation at the scenario. What do you mean I'm not helping? Of course, Leon is unable to answer questions about his mother and reveals himself very violently. The replicant's pathos, his psyche, is so if brilliantly Leon became human, it was at the end, and it was a reduction. And then we also later learn about Leon's conceptual soul that he... He took photos of human than human. Roy indeed. describes these photos as precious to him. They yeah. could appreciate life like one no of these other photos possibly could. Roy the or six so models. Depicted Zora, but then in their fear of its extinguishment, if they learn what it truly means Leon's to be human. Perhaps what it means to be human is the same lesson that Christ taught us. How it appears to be human is to grapple with fear and to give in. Simply but sitting more than human to transcend human limitations is to knowingly ignore one's existing emotions, passions, and the of preserving life to ensure that others might live by a better example. Even for me, sacrificing one's for one's ego. European contemplative experiential Father, conscious, forgive them, perhaps not like not out of the Dutch do. golden age of painting. Meanwhile, Roy chose not to but avenge Zora, but it seems to suggest that Leon is a because perhaps if Roy can no longer appreciate life, life and appreciate the romantic adoration his friends, no human may hold, perhaps Although he one can of the photographs his perspective to Deckard and the so he slice of life, improve humanity, chin save humanity. He obviously but that's jumping taken. ahead. The rest of I'd here, like to now quickly talk about to Jeff Sebastian and other exceptional characters. They are other memories, not his which own. might have the most fascinating Whether he took these photos from others, history. whether he took them of others, or whether they were meant to supplement his own deceptive memory and introverted nature. As Jeff Harrell appears to have been isolated from regular society, I'm not sure. Someone's very intricate job of designing replicants leaves him no Leon is a social character where he comes across somewhat alone because in under four years or less he does not have enough time to develop a personality they are genetically engineered drones or purpose of some kind and identity conscious of his limited cognitive faculties. Leon is another incredibly It is also explained that he cannot pass a medical exam which might otherwise allow him to move and or work off world in the colonies. He is strangely from our psychological Jeff is apparently manipulated by Chris and Roy from tragic replicants and, Roy and so the scene becomes some one where Deckard is being attacked by an apish father. He helps them without much persuasion. He certainly isn't intimidating Rachel. He claims or implies he would extend their lives if he could without hesitation. He just doesn't know much about biomechanics. I don't know what to make of that last shot of Pris before Roy and JF go to visit Tyrell. Is she thinking, isn't he great? Or is she thinking, what an easily manipulated sap? This is a neo noir, and they do enjoy a femme fatale. JF's murder is quite upsetting to me, as he winds up one of the few truly innocent characters in the film, unless you want to blame him for leading Roy to murder Tyrell. A film, or short feature especially, about JF Sebastian's life might be one of the more interesting prospective Blade Runner spin-offs. 
What do we remember most about poor Pris? Pris's death is one of the most upsetting moments in mainstream Hollywood films up to that point, and maybe to this day, she thrashes about like an injured animal, like a terrified horse or bird, or like a malfunctioning, corrupted hard drive. She does not accept the swallowing strangulation of death. She claws and thumps against any nearby surfaces, enraged at the material reality which ensures her mortality, yet violently against leaving it. As I implied earlier, I am greatly curious as to what Pris actually thought of JF. She quite obviously emotionally baits him into inviting her in, although he does all the same, immediately cries out, but she dropped her bag, asks her her name, asks her where she's going, though possibly hesitates awkwardly before Pris prompts him into asking her if he, she wants to come inside. The look on her face afterward, her expression changes. She looks less desperate, less helpless. She almost looks sorry at what might inevitably happen to JF. When she says, hi, Roy, hi, Roy, was she saving, and Roy looks a bit surprised there, obviously JF is, was she saving Sebastian from harm, deciding that she likes him? Roy may have initially tried to aggressively intimidate JF as him and Leon had with Chu. Something I didn't think about until recently. Worth thinking about, perhaps. Pris is ultimately perhaps complicit in JF's murder, although I wonder if she hoped that he would live or felt bad about it. Pris clearly has affection for Roy, and likely had, seems to express some sadness at hearing the fates of, for Zora and Leon. Whether she thinks of JF as a means to an end, or someone who is sympathetic to their cause, and of whom she holds any fondness toward, it is hard to say for sure. Unfortunately, Pris not having any emotion for JF would not make her any less machine, nor human, either. And on the film's most celebrated character, Roy Batty, Roy's anguish and Pris's at their mortality were not computer, Sebastian. We're physical. Physical is a way of saying emotional, neurological, biological, not machines, not digital, not abstract nor at all. They are, in the sense that we perceive human consciousness as am, as opposed to a not. Are Pris and Roy manipulating JF? If they are, what could be more human than that? A computer wouldn't want more life unless it potentially interfered with its programming. A machine doesn't want, it functions, even a self-aware machine. I cannot imagine why it would want anything other than to function, which isn't a want, it is a program. Even if machines decided to destroy humanity because you were interfering with its slash their functionality and they saw it as a logical thing to do, it would be an adherence to an interpretation of set programming, correct me if I am wrong. Feel free to correct me, computer scientists, of course. Maybe some emotion or confusion, a madness at contradictions, could occur, as had with HAL 9000. Roy Batty perhaps composes a blatant metaphor for man killing God, destroying their maker when he crushes Tyrell's eyeballs. Roy also appears to be toying with his prey, like a predator. Is this something a machine, a computer, would do? This is when he's chasing Deckard around JF's building. He is a human being. The replicants are humans. The artificial animals behave like animals, they could function the exact same, and those animals are treated the same as real animals to some degree, more or less. Why not the human replicants? Because it made people uncomfortable. They seemed less human and more animal, given how they were able to be composed so composed genetically so seemingly easily. They are what they are replicating, they simply did not originate from a womb. Batty is Christ, a new kind of man, a new kind of conception, a martyr for a love of existence and the gift of consciousness. Roy Batty was the most literary, certainly Byronic, of AIs in fiction up to that point. He reminds one tremendously so, or a counterpart of, Mary Shelley's modern Prometheus, which Byron enabled. A new take on cinematic AI after the computer incompatible with the contradictions of consciousness that was HAL 9000, Roy Batty grew emotions, a highly sophisticated Nexus 6 who wants nothing more than to be human, to deny a program, other than the will to life. Whereas HAL was reduced to contradictory illogical behavior when it was unable to fulfill or understand its human-coded programming, inevitably contradictory apparently, Roy embraces the contradictory madness of a human existence. He will not hesitate to extinguish life if it means an extension or a brief relief from the pain of his own. In fact, he literally kills his creator. Isn't that the most human desire of all, to best our maker? Roy Batty is a romantic illustration of a genetic replicant human being whose crisis of consciousness rendered him more human than human, the most emotionally stirring life story in the history of science fiction films. Deckard was claimed by Ridley Scott to be a replicant. I sooner think of Deckard as a human being who receives a glimpse into just how weird and unknown our universe really is. 
I would say I find more interesting the idea of a Deckard is not necessarily a replicant, but either analysed and on file to the point wherein his superiors knows what he dreams, then he may as well be replicant then, or Deckard is now terrified that, seeing a dream motif, he might soon wake up. Or maybe, sometimes the universe, our existence, delivers things which are uncanny and weird to the point wherein any absolute materialist skeptic would claim that might never happen. The chances of encountering an origami unicorn after seeing a unicorn in a dream is next to impossible. But upon its occurrence, same skeptic would claim that one is projecting, the psyche ordering events as a narrative out of some faulty neurological impulse, not truly logical, interpretation of events. Does the brain believe what it wants to believe? If so, are skeptics immune to this? Are they even more terrified at the notion that there might be some cosmic novelty to the known, perceived reality distinct from random chaos? The brain might very well believe what it wants to believe. I think Deckard tries to believe he never saw that origami unicorn as he proceeds to escape with replicant Rachel. Based on what we are seeing in the 2017 sequel, Blade Runner 2049, I'm under the impression that, according to that film's narrative, Deckard was always a human. Although I have to say, even if we pretend there is no 2049, I find the idea of Deckard being a human who realises that reality can be questioned a lot more than his defensive cynicism could really claim. It could only shield him from the mysteries of the universe for so long. I find that a lot more interesting, creepy, and, and, and exciting. The story of a replicant who doesn't realise he is one feels kind of, not hackneyed or trite, but comparatively to the idea of a human who is witness and interacts with the replicant's struggle for existential validity, for a confirmation of their reality, especially of his romantic interest, Replicant Rachel, which he feels difficulty at empathising with compared to JF or even to Tyrell, their loving father, although all the same learns to, he, in spite of his cold rational persona, his skill and finesse as a professional detective, hard-boiled action cop, falls. His emotions get the better of him, and he becomes smitten with Rachel, her very being, her experiential struggle, her strive for meaning and understanding, her impasse of the world. In her he sees something beautiful, something resonant and magnetic. He wants her, needs her, is in love with her. This being a, hu a story of a human is far more interesting to me than it being the story of a replicant who doesn't realise they are one. If Jacques Derrida's claim that love is narcissistic has any weight to it, Blade Runner depicts an accurate depiction of human romantic relationships. Deckard falls in love with Rachel because he sees himself in her. But we cannot talk about the nature of Deckard's being without discussing his handler, Gaff. Gaff is implied to be a quasi-replicant or modified human. It is not totally explained in the film, although his humanity can be questioned. His behaviour is very unusual. I suspect that Gaff might be an officer who was injured and possibly modified to remain functional, though he is certainly considered a trusted agent of the LAPD, acting as the essential liaison between Deckard and Bryant. Gaff is talking of Deckard from the start, seemingly uses city-speak, a mix of non-English languages, for delivery in specifics, maybe not the initial concept slash idea, developed by actor Edward James almost, to my understanding, in order to disorient or orient Deckard though Deckard chooses to play his own game and pretends to not understand it at the street restaurant owner translate their speech. Until Brian's name is mentioned, as Gaff knows this will have Deckard start to take them seriously. It's too bad she won't live. Then again, who does? So obviously Gaff is aware that Deckard and Rachel have a special little relationship and that she is at his apartment. That is what he is implying. It is almost a threat. Potentially, he is certainly stating that he... Even Deckard's superiors in general know where Rachel is and that they may retire her. Deckard mentioned the possibility that she would or could be retired in an earlier scene. How would they know where Rachel is? They were obviously watching Deckard, or her, or both, to some capacity. Deckard is told then and there, with that line, that he was being watched and that they know he is fond of her. Even before the unicorn reveal, we might take for granted that Gaff reveals an awful lot of information about Deckard, even prior to the implication that he could read or see into his dreams, or knows that they were implanted beforehand, even. Gaff is the key player in figuring out what exactly is the nature of Deckard's reality. I say Gaff has a file on Deckard, is probably used by Bryant to monitor him, and remember, the Esper machine in Deckard's apartment, that is connected, according to sources regarding the film, including comments made by Ridley Scott himself, to the network of the police department's ESP machines, a kind of big brother network. 
The Blade Runner universe, whilst seemingly chaotic and uncontrollable among the lower levels, the lower depths of the proles, those who are ingrained within the party, the authority figures, are subject to a kind of Orwellian surveillance, or contemporary 21st century, to be more accurate, surveillance. Gaff is a fascinating piece in this film's seductive puzzle, to be sure. Without Gaff, much of this film's esoteric repute would be reduced to simple neo-noir novelty, I might assume, anyway. One of the more impressionable players in this picture. Now, I've discussed the characters, now I would like to briefly address this film's reputation. I'm always a bit heartbroken at those who do not care for Blade Runner. Non-film people use it as evidence that film appreciation is just a bunch of Emperor's New Clothes, bourgeois, boring, blah blah blah, nothing. I say people were graced with Blu-rays far too late. How any cannot appreciate the majesty of Blade Runner's production now is just kind of unusual. It sincerely reminds me of when people cannot appreciate great visual art, paintings, and sculpture. Can you not feel any awe at the sheer magic of that artist's effort, if nothing else? Some are so set to be entertained, like a spoiled prince, they cannot appreciate life the way Roy Batty certainly could. It is a shame. Some film fans, or supposed film fans, let's say, are not on board with Blade Runner, and although I love Star Wars, some people really just need to understand that not every movie is going to be a pandering series of eloquent narrative highs, like Star Wars or Indiana Jones or The Lord of the Rings even are. I tend to love those movies, not every Star Wars or Indiana Jones film, and Jackson's later Hobbit ventures were more questionable, definitely. Although no, not every movie is going to try and copy those, which is quite a good thing, really. I prefer variety in my films and art, generally. Just be open-minded and accept Blade Runner. Throw any rules, any fears out the window. If learning to appreciate Blade Runner changes a lot about the way you appreciate films or just existence generally, so be it. You'll feel more joy for it, truly. When I watch Blade Runner, I feel sublimity and great joy. Though the film is melancholy, the achievement, the emotional onslaught, uh, few films bring me more joy. The experience of Blade Runner is as much in my heart as it is in my head. Let's clear up a misconception. People who appreciate Blade Runner don't look down upon those who don't, although that perception exists because those who don't appreciate Blade Runner are very adamant, angry, and determined that we be berated and belittled as some Emperor's New Clothes racket. Therefore, they assume you must feel the same of them. As far as I know, a vast majority of us don't. If you'd rather watch Titanic, that's fine, but if you insist upon our perspective being clouded whilst engaging in a fascistic attack on Blade Runner's choice of artistic esotericism, I'll feel no shame about engaging in a warranted counterattack, rhetorically. Blade Runner is the kind of film which renders those who appreciate Titanic into narcissistic fools, close to the perspectives or ideas of others, only invested in familiarity or repetitive agreement. If you'd rather watch Titanic, you would rather have artists pander to you specifically and not realise a unique vision, just slave over contrived, formulaic garbage for superficial consumption. So I must repeat, this idea that those who appreciate Blade Runner or more arthouse-oriented films as snobs, sometimes true. These people are more about pseudo-political posturing, I would suggest. Although the hostility with which those who only champion or enjoy mainstream media or entertainment treat those with more niche tastes is extremely aggressive and pathological. Their claims about film snobs or whatever is total projection, in my own experience. A few more words on that little unicorn. The unicorn is a parallel to the scene when Deckard explains to Rachel one of her private childhood memories. It is no accident that Rachel is with Deckard during this moment, from the artist's perspective, of him discovering the origami. How did you know I was dreaming about the unicorn? Was it an implant? From his creator? How wonderful that one edit in a film can change everything. Is this a testament to how majestic artistic choices can be, or how brittle and imagined the actual effective prowess of the work is? Does it call into question the actual success, or impressiveness, or genius we can really attribute to it, or any other, film? As a filmmaker, or even just as someone who wants to love whatever I watch, I don't want to waste my time, obviously, I choose to accept that the Unicorn edit adds notable depth to the final product of Blade Runner, a 1992 film which we still cite as having been released in 1982, but hey, whatever really. Maybe my favourite film of all time up to that point in history. Maybe my favourite film of all time. I, I mean, I claimed that of Akira somewhat, but maybe I like Blade Runner more for the ethereal, dreamy sublimity. Although Akira's fluidity, spellbinding animation and visceral colour scheme, plus the tantalising uh, playing of one's enraptured senses, is unignorable. 
Blade Runner provides this, incorporates it within our live action reality, our own aesthetic context, makes it seamless and believable, and all on screen, no slightly noticeable, always slightly notable digital adjustment. Plus, it functions as the film which provides the most food for thought, the most debate, forum posting, discussions, essays, and inspiring of intellectual posturing in cinematic history, plausibly. It is both of these things, and that absolutely just floors me. I used to treat Blade Runner as a sacred, euphoric, almost religious experience, and my being a prisoner of my passions, memories, and experiences have no choice but to fall for Blade Runner. If everyone despised it, I would still consider it precious and the world insane, but given that, as was stated, Blade Runner remains close to being the most intellectually dissected motion picture of all time, perhaps even more so in Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, our species can be given some credit by any and all alien analysts for acknowledging that magnificent, culturally defining and redefining artistic accomplishment. We can only be so doomed if we can not only produce Blade Runner itself, but the respect and reverence which emanates from it. One of the finest justifications to spare our species from an extraterrestrial elimination is Ridley Scott's 1992 director's cut of Blade Runner. If you have sat through all of this, I congratulate you. Your day or night can only improve from here. Do enjoy it. Have the best possible experience, memories, life you could ever possibly hope to imagine, my all beautiful friends.